Good afternoon from the Bay Area. My name is Jason Putnam Gordon, and you're here with Idea to IPO. And today we're going to talk about what is up next in the rest of 2021 in venture capital. We've got a great panel here today. We've got Af Hernandez, who's a principal at Next Xterra uh, Energy Investments and also the co founder of VC La Familia. We've got Nunu Gonzalez Pedro, who is managing partner and founder of Chameleon. And we've got Bill Reichardt, who is general partner and of Pegasus Tech Ventures. Before, uh, before we get started, I wanna give you a little bit of an overview of today's conversation. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a panel discussion for about an hour, uh, at which point we'll take audience questions. If you've got a question, please submit it via the Q&A function. It's easiest for me to track that's particularly important because I'm not only moderating, but I'm also running all the tech in the background. So if there's some sort of tech goof, or if for some reason I'm looking down, it's because I'm trying to do multiple things at once. It's not because the panel is uninteresting. They're gonna be fantastic. Uh, other note, today's conversation is recorded. So the good news is if you missed some or all of it, I'm gonna send it to you afterwards, provided that you've registered. That'll, that'll come in about a week or so. Downside is it's gonna be recorded for posterity. So um, please know that your, your question is being publicly submitted and don't give us any confidential information with that. Now, again, my name is Jason Putnam Gordon. I'm a venture capital and emerging growth company attorney with Pulsinelli. We've got a great panel. I'm gonna allow them to go around and introduce each one of them themselves while you're filling out this audience survey. And then we're gonna get started with today's conversation. Af, maybe we'll start with you. Thank you, Jason. Um, thank you so much for, for having me. Before anything, I have to say the, the, the obvious, I, I am here uh, of my own accord and not representative of my company or anything like that. And I just want to share my experience with the community. Um, my name is Af Fernandez. I'm um, an investor principal at Nextera Energy uh, Investments. We're the largest uh, energy company in North America. Uh, outside of that, I'm also co-founder of VC Familia. We're the uh, largest Lendnex um, Lendnex organization for VCs, um, period. Uh, I am, my main focus is around clean tech and sustainability and climate. Uh, it's kind of what I've cut my teeth into and also helping entrepreneurs scale within that market. And so I'm very happy to be here and, and really excited to be, you know, next to these uh, big wigs in our, in, in our industry. So thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. After. It's our first panel together. So I'm excited for it. Uh, yeah. Nunu, uh, why don't you go next, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, great. So I'm the managing partner and founder at Chameleon, a new VC firm that literally was just created. I've been venture capital for the last 12 years. Uh, the fund we just did a close on um, is my third fund. I personally focus most of my time. I've done a bunch of stuff around frontier tech and deep tech, uh, and I've been many robotics and AI uh, panels in the past. But I focus most of my time around consumer software, consumer hardware and horizontal software as a service. Uh, investments include companies like uh, Appani, Gusto, Rubric, uh, one company that IPO today, Robinhood, uh, DraftKings, which IPO'd last year. Uh, we were, I think we were having a similar, a similar panel last year when they IPO'd through that reverse merger. Um, and um, and uh, I've also invested in a company called Verta Health, which I'm very proud of, which reverses diabetes type two. Uh, net of it, as I'm based in the Bay Area, Chameleon really focuses very broadly across verticals. I focus as I said, on consumer horizontal SaaS. I have a partner in Europe that focuses more on industrial enterprise software, vertical SaaS, uh, blockchain. And then I have a co-managing partner here in the U.S. who focuses more on frontier tech and deep tech um, and uh, still goes back to consumer, which is where she originally came from. We do normally series seed series A investments, so one to five million uh, first check in up to 10 million over the lifetime of the investment. And we are multi geo, so I would say probably 50, 60 percent of our investments are going to be in the US, but we do invest in Europe um, and, and elsewhere, Israel, Middle East, um, Asia, et cetera. Well, wonderful. It's great to have you back, Nuno. Mm -hmm. And last but certainly not least, Bill Reichardt, tell us a little bit about yourself and maybe some of the developments the last. Uh, in the last few right. months. Right, so uh, since we were together last, earlier this year, um, uh, my firm, uh, Garage Technology Ventures, which I co-founded many years ago with Guy Kawasaki and a few other people, um, has merged with Pegasus Tech Ventures. So I am now a general partner at Pegasus Tech Ventures. Pegasus Tech Ventures 
is a is a much bigger and much broader platform than Garage. Um, Pegasus is a $1.5 billion global venture fund. We focus on strategic investments for our limited partners. Almost all of our limited partners are multinational corporations. We've got about 35 multinational corporations that are our limited partners. And so the big idea behind Pegasus is to find emerging technologies wherever they are on the planet and fund them and connect them with our network of corporate partners to accelerate their growth and success. So we have a win-win-win all the way around. That's that's the big idea behind Pegasus. So um, you know, we're investors across the stack, you know, from top to bottom. We're investors in, in SpaceX and Bird and Airbnb and Color Genomics and 23andMe at the sort of and SoFi at the sort of recent pending IPO level. And uh, you know, down through life science, material science, um, IT, hardware, chip companies, down at the early emerging stage level. So we're we're very broad based in terms of what we're investing in, and um, have a fantastic platform for uh, funding and growing companies. So delighted to be back. Um, looking forward to the conversation. Well, we're delighted to have you here. And, and because of such a broad base, we're going to expect you to answer every single question. Uh, <laughs> you know, yourself. that's not the problem, as you should probably know, Jason. No, I know. I know. I'm just kidding. I'm just me controlling me and Nuno. That's the issue you've got. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I've been here before. No, no, it's a problem I enjoy. Well, <laughs> so with that in mind, let me tell you a little bit about who's in the audience today. Uh, and then we can have start our conversation. So we've got 60% uh, of the room are founders. We've got uh, about a third of the room is, so, okay. So these answers, you can answer multiple, uh, you know, multiple answers for each question, or at least the second one. So we've got 60% of the folks here are, are founders. We've got about a third who are in early stage companies. We've got 12% growth stage. Uh, we've got at least one, you know, 1% 1 from late stage, a few folks from mature companies. We've got some hmm. corporate, and some traditional VCs, and obviously maybe some crossover with you, uh, Bill, kind of playing maybe both sides in that sense, and some angel investors. And then the bulk of the folks here are going to be in the Bay Area, at least that are watching it live. Uh, lots of times the recording gets watched from the folks who you know signed up in Europe and Africa. So we expect other people to watch them a little bit later. Uh, third in the US, and then again, handful from other continents. So with that, well, let's start the conversation. I think really to have or to, to, to have a fulsome conversation as much as we can in the next sort of 50 minutes or so, we'll just sort of rewind the clock, just say, you know, going into 2020, there was more, you know, dry powder, uh, you know, that ready and primed to be deployed than ever before. There was a tremendous, terrible exogenous shock to the system in 2020. Um, ultimately, 2020, I think, turned out to be a robust year, especially sort of late stage for these companies. Uh, seed stage also did pretty well. Earlier was a little bit quieter, a little bit choppier. Um, but 2021, in the first half of the year, I think that we've seen, uh, or it foreshadows maybe a banner year once again, probably going to eclipse 2019. So with that in mind, seed early stage, growth stage, late stage, exits, all these things are open and uh, capital is being deployed and funds are raising more capital than ever before. With that in mind, I think because most of the folks who are currently watching us are in the early space, early stage, maybe the panel, uh, starting with Bill, if you could talk a little bit about uh, what you're seeing in the early stage, sort of large A, excuse me, large stage, seed stage, maybe early A stage, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that you're seeing in the deals that are getting done today? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, I mean, you, you refer to COVID as a terrible exogenous shock, but the, you know, amazing thing is that it was, I, I hate to be sort of incorrect about this, but I mean, it's, it, was, it was one of the best things that happened to venture capital, arguably, in the sense that, that, what has happened is the yes, there were a bunch of sectors that they got they got, they got whacked. You know, um, obviously travel, hospitality, and a few related sectors got whacked, but COVID was an incredible stimulus 
for a whole bunch of stuff happening all over the world that was then um, in turn, it was fueled by these massive injections of, of taxpayer dollars into all these economies and fueled by the fact that there was just piles and piles of cash around the world that had no place to go. Um, so the you know cash had to go somewhere and 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 bonds obviously were you know, not going to go bonds. You're not going to go commercial real estate, right? Um, residential real estate has done amazingly well, but in terms of asset classes, venture capital sort of leaped to the fore as a as an exciting asset class, both just chasing returns but also chasing opportunity. And so what has happened to our sector over the, this cycle is we moved from being a narrow asset class focused on IT communications and a few other things to this incredibly broad-based asset class that touches pretty much every part of our economy, every part of our lives in every geography on the planet. And so, you know, it, fundamentally great news for entrepreneurs because of this acceptance and awareness and, and urgency to find and fund innovation. And so there was a little bit of anxiety um, when we had all this new money coming in from the non-traditional investors, that that was simply chasing the big hot deals, that it was simply piling into, piling into the unicorn space. Um, and that's been probably the bulk, right? Um, but the good news is, the good news is we've seen it <laughs> trickle down, um, you know, to the early stage, where we are seeing, uh, you know, lots of money that is going in to early stage. Uh, now, having said that, unfortunately, unfortunately, it is still hard because as much as there's more money in the early stage, there's more competition in the early stage, and and the competition is getting smarter. Um, you have more and more, you know, serial entrepreneurs who know how to play the game and it's getting broader because it's happening all over the planet. And now again, you gotta be paying attention to what's going on in Europe and what's going on in Asia, as well as what's going on here in Silicon Valley. So it's, you know, lots of money, lots of enthusiasm, a lot more investors, a lot broader opportunity in terms of innovation, um, but you know, still tough, still very competitive. Uh, and so you really have to, you know, you really have to uh, show up with your A game. So that's big over. Okay. Can, can I that's can I go good news, bad news, Jason? Yeah, please, absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's so a I, I agree agree with everything that Bill just said, and I think it's important to understand these flows really well because the capital flows that are fueling. Uh, venture capital, the fact that there are new funds being created in venture capital, larger funds being created in venture capital, and that ultimately are making their way to startups, be it their early stage, you know, mid stage or late stage, are being driven by this flows that uh, basically Bill was talking about. And the reality, if, if I simplify it even one more level, is at a certain point in time, we thought there was going to be a huge crash, right? I mean, circa March last year, and there wasn't a huge crash. There was a sort of a crash and then it immediately went back up and there was a lot of stimuli put into the market and, you know, consumer stimuli and other types of stimuli. And then what happened was people started turning and like, where am I going to put my money? It's not just I'm going to put it in public equities. I'm going to put it in tech public equities. And that's how we see all these companies that are worth over a trillion dollars and, you know, all the flows that have gone into it a massively let's call it bubbly software as a service market, even in public markets. And the reason why that's important for early stage, and I realize most of the people on this call are, uh, are entrepreneurs listening to us today, is it ripples down. Because as soon as you start moving all these assets to public equities in the tech space, you're like, where next can I put my money? Well, I know where I can put it. I can put it in private markets, right? And if you, re if you remember, the first thing that rebounded pretty quickly was also the late stage deals in private markets, right? Companies that were almost going IPO. And then it went mid stage. And then obviously, ultimately, it goes to early stage as well. So um, now to the bad news. I think we're definitely in an asset bubble in equities, both in private and public markets. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not an economist. I, I, I don't pretend to be an economist. But if this is not a bubble, 
God, I'm very happy to be alive right now. Right? <laughs> so, because this is the new economy we're talking back in 99, 2000, right? I, I don't think there is a new economy. I think at some point, a lot of these assets will need to get a hard landing. Then the discussion, whether we're going to have a hard landing or a soft landing. Mm -hmm. But for me, there is a fundamental bubble going on right now. And that leads me to the next point, which is if you're an entrepreneur, uh, I agree with Bill's comments. You're obviously getting a lot of competition. There's a lot of noise. Everyone's trying to do their own startup. There's also, though, a lot of competition on the supply side between us, between us VCs, right? There's more and more new funds. There's more and more new firms. I just created a new firm, although I've been doing this for 11 years. So there's more and more of this going on. And so I would say, and this maybe is a sort of a soundbite, but I do want to make it very clear. If you can't raise my right money right now in early stages, be it pre-seed, seed, or A, if you can't raise right now in Europe or US, which are the two markets I can really vouch for, you have no right to be an entrepreneur. Uh, and I, I'm exaggerating, and I know Bill is going to kick my ass after this, but it, it is, it is, it is right now, if you can't raise, then I am not sure that your business has the right to raise, putting it in a more mild manner, or has the right, right, has the right to raise right now. So if you can't raise right now, maybe your business doesn't have the right to raise, right? And so, uh, which doesn't mean you don't have a business. It doesn't mean that you can't build a small and medium business. It doesn't mean that you can build a lifestyle business. It doesn't mean that you are not ready for raising yet, but you might be ready to raise in one or two years. But right now, everyone is investing. Angels are back. Right. VCs are aggressive and investing aggressively. It is a banner year, as you were mentioning, Jason. So, again, I would just say go and raise because this, in my opinion, will not last forever. Bubbles do burst uh, if I'm right about it. Uh, if I'm wrong about it, there will be a soft landing. I've talked to a bunch of bankers who believe there's a soft landing of 15, 20 percent correction on equities, certainly tech public equities. I don't know. I believe it's going to burst. Some people think it's going to be a soft landing. We see where we head, but it can't stay like this, right? We remember last year before COVID, we were having the single biggest bull market sequence in history, right? We had been in bull markets for a very, very long time. And so there was a mini crash and nothing happened. And like magically now everything is fine. We're, we're all fine, right? And I'm like, well, there's still COVID going on around the world. There's still people that need to get vaccinated. We're still discussing masks. Yeah. And and so anyway, I, I, I will leave it at that. I think if you're an entrepreneur, raise right now. That's That would be my advice. Yeah, so I want to make sure Af can, before Bill starts the beating, uh, I want to make sure that Af can jump in and no, because I also want to jump in. So I, I I agree with most of it, except for the, the last comment, you know, on that. Uh, I, I think, yeah, valuations are high. I am very, very much aware as to what Jay Powell is doing. I'm very much aware as to where inflation is going. I'm very much on, on keeping up with that news just to see where the direction of this entire market is going. Uh, I do want to push back on the funding. Uh, and purely because my my scope and my lens from a diversity standpoint is there's a difference. If you look at the numbers, actually, the rounds have just been getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so to me, it's always something that I always talk about is what is the access for entrepreneurs to be able to receive that capital? Um, is Are you opening up the access or is it the same funnels of money going to the same group of people from the same prestigious universities? And, and whether you're opening up the aperture to give entrepreneurs a little bit more opportunity to actually see the diversity of things. Additionally, I think founders are, and, and, and it'd be great to, to see the audience on this, founders are being a little bit more capital efficient now because their workforce is, is, is all over the country. And it seems a lot of the founders that I'm talking to are, are being able to attract better talent um, with companies that are a little older that aren't willing to offer them remote work. Um, and so from a capital efficiency standpoint, you might be able to get, and I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs do it, get better talent, um, use the funding a little bit more efficiently for them to be able to scale and, and grow quickly. So to me, like, I'm going to push back because I, I don't, I, I, I it's, a, it's a strong statement to see if you can't raise right now, maybe you shouldn't be, because I think certain communities just don't have the access to do that, even if they have a gangbuster idea and they're going after it and they can build an amazing team. I think access is a huge thing to talk about within our, within our industry. And then also like on the flip side, I, I think because of the, of not having to be in office, not forcefully having to be an SF, like, you know, we were talking about that earlier, like 
we're, we're, we're being a little bit different about being SF or New York or in the big cities. Like you are a little bit more capital efficient on your raises, yet the rounds just keep getting bigger. And so it's, it's a very interesting dynamic of what's going on in the market. Yeah, okay. So maybe I can bridge the, um, you know, F and, you know, in that regard, you know, because, uh, you know, absolutely what F is saying is it ain't easy for lots and lots of entrepreneurs for a whole bunch of reasons that I do not necessarily put them in Nunu's camp of you don't deserve money. But, you know, after, I mean, to your point, pretty much everywhere we go around the world, the venture community is broader and deeper than it was five years ago. Um, and so it's, you know, the, the, you know, when we, so when we started Garage, when we started Garage during the bubble, um, our big, so it was, you know, we launched in, in, in 1999. Um, our big idea was that the next big thing was not the internet, that the next big thing was global entrepreneurship and innovation. And so the garage thesis was we could get a disproportionate advantage by reaching out to entrepreneurs globally rather than just sitting here in Silicon Valley and focusing on Silicon Valley. We assumed that venture capital you know, since it had had this explosive growth in the 90s, that it was going to be this global phenomenon and that entrepreneurship and innovation was going to follow globally. And it, just, it did not happen nearly as fast as we thought it would. We thought it was going to happen faster. And it, it's actually, you know, it's still to this day has not diffused as broadly as you would think it would because money is supposed to be smart and smart money should be chasing opportunities and there are opportunities all over the globe. Uh, so, but it has happened to some extent. And so pretty much in every ecosystem around the world and even around the United States, there is more opportunity than there was just five years ago. So it is, it is getting better, but it's still, you know, um, Aft's point of view, my point of view, it's still hard, in, no matter how good you are, right? I, and so yeah. to, to, to finish that point, though, to bridge to Nunu, <laughs> it's not that you don't, if you, if you can't raise money now, it's not that you don't deserve it. <laughs> it means it's because you're not doing it right. That's the problem. I mean, and now, and there are a whole bunch of things that you may be doing wrong, you may not be doing a good job of making clear what your compelling value proposition is. If you're not good at that, then you go out and you buy my book. <laughs> yes, you had, to, you had to do the segue, Bill. Yes, go, you should buy Bill's book, by the way. It is a professional. You go out yeah. and you, you, know, you buy the book. It's called Getting to Wow, Silicon Valley Pitch Secrets for Entrepreneurs. So that may be what you're doing wrong, you know, and it may be yeah. that you're not following, you're not following what Steve Blank and Eric Reese, you know, teach you, which is yeah. spending more time with customers and figuring out, you know, do you have fit or not? Do you have product customer fit? Do you have product market fit? So, you know, there's a whole bunch, or you're talking to the wrong investors, or you're in the wrong geography, and you got to move. So there, there are a whole bunch of things you 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 might just be doing wrong rather than you have some inherent congenital failure <laughs> that means you can't raise no and, and i do want the right to respond because okay. there's a couple of important and maybe right, this is a good seconds. segue yeah, this right. is a good this, this is a good segue jason you did want to talk yeah. about diversity and yeah, absolutely and inequality yeah, absolutely. so i think it's a good segue right. to that as well yeah, yeah. Right. um Deserve is both sides. Deserve is if you're not ready, you don't deserve, right? I mean, it's the same thing. Uh, yeah. You should listen, by the way, to my podcast as well on Tech Deciphered. And we talk a lot about a lot of these elements, a podcast that I have with Bertrand Schmidt, who's the co-founder of Appani. Uh, so I'll put in my plug there in, in, as well. Um, I, I understand the point that AF is making, and I agree with it. We were just talking about it, which is access, for, exa for example, to Latinx entrepreneurs. I find it difficult to have a lot of inbound to have access to Latinx entrepreneurs, right? And so, so there's definitely communities that in some ways have more difficulties in enfranchising themselves and connecting with certain types of VCs around the world. That said, it was never easier than it has been right now, in particular amped up by COVID because we're all remote mostly and we're all in front of our computers to reach to, to a VC. 
And that was the point I was making. Maybe it's a very strong soundbite, but it's the point I was making, which is it's never been as easy as it is right now because we're stuck in our homes and we're doing this. Furthermore, and maybe this is a good segue to the diversity discussion, and, and Bill knows this, maybe half doesn't, but you know, mm -hmm. Strive Capital and now with Chameleon, we were probably the first guys who were quant early stage investors. We develop analytics engines in the house that help us with both deal sourcing and due diligence. Chameleon is being created with the notion of taking that to the next level. We have more people in technology, in our technology team in-house than we have in our deal team. And what that means is we are focused on finding the best companies around the world in a totally unbiased way. And I think that's the future. The future is when I'm looking top of funnel, I don't even know where these people went to school or whatever, right? I just know that basically it's an interesting company that I might have a first conversation with. And that for me is the ultimate equalizer. The ultimate equalizer is you're in Romania, you're in Idaho, you're wherever, but you have an interesting business. We should be talking to you. For me, that's the ultimate factor of unbiasing this whole thing. And, and I believe very strongly in this. And I, you know, Bill knows this because I've, I've talked with him too many times about this, but yes. it's like, I believe truly that that's the future. It's not just that VC firms need to be more productive, that they need to be more fact-based, which I believe as well, but VC firms fundamentally also need to be less biased because actually being very biased is bad for business. It's not just that because we are great people, it's bad for business because we miss opportunities because of that, because we miss great companies because of that. Yeah. I totally agree. And I, you know, and, and as, as Newton is, when we started Garage, we wanted to be quant-based. We tried to be quant-based. We tried to come up with algorithms and, and, and uh, you know, and coding systems for assessing companies. We were the first venture capital firm to take in business plans digitally. Um, you know, we got over 100,000 business plans digitally through the Garage website we set up in 1999. And we had massive, amount, we had massive amounts of data. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't for lack of compute power that we, we gave up on. We gave up on, you know, we tried. We did try and, and then it's a longer conversation. Um, and God bless, you know, if you can, if you crack this knot, I mean, and, and we got to catch up and find out. Um, you know, how that's all going. But there's something more than that, which is you still have this issue and you, you, you did touch on it, and, uh, which is, is you're not going to get anything into the top of the funnel unless you either figure out how to reach out and grab it or you get them to come in to your funnel. And that, you know, your point about inbound um, and, and outreach. And so that's, you know, no matter how good you are at coding deals and opportunities, you still have this 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 um, this access flow challenge, and um, and I you know I mean I, I don't know how deep we want to get into this. Um, we do not um, you know I, I, we don't have any women on this panel. Shame on us, right? <laughs> um, but uh, well, but uh, it's it's you know it's it is obviously, and I totally agree with Nuna's point that that bias is bad for business. And uh, you know, my co-managing partner is a woman. Very proud of that. So you know, and, and we did. Changing. We, it's changing. We did, but uh, we had to last minute. She, she got books. But regardless oh. of that, I, I guess I have a question for Af, which which is, do we have you know, what do we see kind of coming out of so same with the theme of what's coming out of twenty twenty one, and moving ahead. You know, the this issue of the funnel, and maybe the flattening of the of the sort of world in terms of being able to do deals cross border. I mean, is that, do we see this as being helpful? Is this helpful? It seemed like there was some regression yeah. in 2020, um, but you know, as I look at some of the stats, it seems like maybe, maybe there's some improvement happening in 2021 in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion. It's kind of back on people's radar and they're focused on it. I, you know, I, I go ahead, F. Yeah, 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 go ahead. Yeah. It's complicated. If this was an easy problem to solve, we would have solved it a long time ago, which, which, which is good and bad. Uh, to Nuno, I'm, I'm gonna respond directly to Nuno. Um, it's been statistically proven even through quantitative analysis, like even if you write code, like if the writers of the code and the developers and, and the architects of the code have biases that they're unaware of, that translates into the code. And that's been directly proven on university studies or anything like that. Uh, actually, one of my professors at Berkeley, you know, wrote a huge article about this on, on, on credit and, and how that was still 
biased, even though they use an algorithm to be able to assess um, the credit risk of, of, of individuals um, because of our unconscious or conscious biases. We, we really aren't sure. I mean, that's where redlining came from. Redlining was okay. supposed to be bad. Like, you know what I mean? When you look back in history, it's supposed to be, but it really wasn't. It, it, it had an ulterior motive. And so I appreciate a lot of funds moving into the more quantitative way of doing it. But even then, venture's not always purely like quantitative. You can't Especially quantitatively. Early stage. Yeah, you can't access a management team quantitatively. It's really hard to do. And because of that, there's that. But that's just that from that standpoint. I think there is a big pipeline issue from understanding. One is just education from like, for me specifically in the Latino, in Latino, like Latinos are the fastest growing population in the United States that are starting businesses. But how many of them know that venture is an available capital stack for them? Uh, how many of them understand even what venture is and whether that's something that they should strive for? Um, and so there's, there's an educational part. There's an access part of like both not only venture capitalists, but also other organizations, things like that, opening up and, re and realizing that there's, there's a community here that will accept them who they, for who they are uh, and, and who they stand for and the, the things that they're trying to achieve. And then internally, like something that I do, it's like we have to have a hard question of like, what, is our, what do our processes look like and what are our internal biases? Like I have, my, I have a mental note of what my internal biases are. And there's a few systems in place on for me to be able to balance that. Is it perfect? No, it's never going to be perfect. Like the, the, a lot of the unconscious biases are things that we're going to have to work through. And as we get older and, and, and figure that out. Uh, but those are a few of the steps that we can see. And, and I think Bill hit it right. It's, it's just like there's, there's part of a pipeline issue. There's part of an educational issue. Um, it is better. It is way better than what it was. I think last year really made that movement. But even then, if you see some of the uh, stats from HBCU and, and a few other funds, like even though the movement of, of diversity happened last year, the numbers didn't really change from a funding perspective. And so where like, sure, it, 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 as a percentage of funding, it didn't really change. As a number, yeah, it did. It's a lot more money, but there's also more money in the space. And so as a percentage of, of funding going to diverse founders and, and fund managers, it, is it really changing or is this something that's gonna take generational? Um, wealth to try to, to try to move through. So that's just my opinion. I could be completely wrong, but but that's that's what I've seen. Well, I think um, obviously it'd be it was a lot more to talk about um, on, on that issue, and and you know with respect to that, um, maybe, maybe this is a natural point to to sort of segue back to kind of what some of the other things that are taking place in 2021 and moving forward. And some of the things that I think Bill mentioned earlier, there was a lot of money that was injected into the system circa 2020. And, and even as we sort of speak now, and I know you you work a lot in energy and climate. I know that you're here of your sort of own accord, AF, but uh, seems like there's some developments that are maybe coming down the pike there. And if you could give us your sort of personal take on things i'd appreciate that this is crazy uh the the market is um i'm so excited for it I, i'm not gonna lie like when i first started like climate tech was never a thing it was always it, it, there was always uh the issue of 08 09 the first climate tech like wave and how that happened and there's always that that a lot of investors had that that thought in their mind whenever they looked at climate tech, whenever they looked at, at, at renewable energies and, and sustainability. Um, this has been a societal change. I think that's that's the biggest change here is like, it's not just a niche. It's like you, all of society understands where this move is going to. And the VC ecosystem has responded as they do quickly, swiftly with a lot of capital backing really innovative uh, entrepreneurs um, to be able to solve this once in a lifetime kind of problem that we're facing. The good part is, is that I, I get to work on a challenging problem that uh, I would be I would be proud to share with my kids and have society and also make a good return on. Uh, and, and I think that's what kind of attracts a lot of people to this space. It is it is a difficult thing. There are you know you know from years like deep tech is, is a hard investment from that standpoint. There are movements from um, the infrastructure bill that's coming in that that really excites us. Uh, but I. I I am blown away how quickly the markets evolved um, and how much capital and how, how generalist funds are really getting educated on the space purely from three years ago. It, it, it's crazy how quickly this has moved. Yeah. 
And I, and I do think even though, you know, COVID is you know, a healthcare crisis, I think it, it, it was a kick in the pants to everyone mm. that, you know, the, the world does things independent of what maybe we want and climate obviously is a piece of that and sustainability is a piece of that. And so it is interesting seeing this resurgence that's going on with, which is broader based. Um, so I was, <clears throat> so the good news, bad news, <laughs> in terms of having been around for a while, um, you know, I, I used to make a joke about how um, when I first invested in AI, I was concerned that I was late to the party because my first investment in, a in AI was in 1989. I was, <laughs> and so I was, I thought, oh God, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm late to the party, right? Yeah. Um, on the flip side, on the flip side, um, we were, you know, Garage wound up being, you know, very successful clean tech investors entirely by accident because our mandate was open and agnostic. We wound up investing in some material science companies before it was called clean tech. And then all of a sudden it was called, you know, we invaded Iraq. <laughs> and the price of gas went through the roof. And all of a sudden, venture capital thought, boy, what a great opportunity now to invest in renewable fuels because we're going to have peak oil, we're going to have, you know, whatever, we need renewable plastics, blah, 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 blah. So we, we made a fortune in clean tech um, because we were in really early and then it became so big that we couldn't play anymore. So we stopped playing in, in like 2006, seven, and then the market crashed, right? So we missed the, you know, poor Vinod Kosla, you know, got wiped out in clean tech because he was, he was all in, um, you know, and we wound up, you know, luck and whatever. So, you know, so we've seen these, we have seen these cycles before. I don't, I don't want to put a damper on it at all. Um, but I got to admit, um, so, you know, Every university grad student and in the world now, it seems, is coming up with their own particular version of carbon capture. Um, you know, because there are all sorts of chemistries and physics around carbon capture. And God bless, right? God bless, but you know, it's still it's still a little, I mean, you know, and I'd really love to hear Af's thinking on 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 carbon capture. <laughs> I don't know, Nuno, I don't think you do that part of the world, but um. But so we're back, you know, we're back into clean tech, which is more broadly ESG, which is more broadly, you know, it's, it has, interestingly, it's much more broad um, than it used to be, which is entirely good. And then the other thing that we've seen is, is I think partly because of COVID, is just much more thinking around social impact more broadly. Um, and so for us, interestingly, so our, with our corporate LPs, so we get to see how these multinational corporates are thinking about, you know, open innovation and tech and tech investment. And what we've seen over the last only few years is this, you know, very noticeable trend toward putting sustainability into their investment strategy, putting putting diversity into their investment strategy, putting climate into their, you know, putting putting equity. Um, equity into their investment strategy, um, and interestingly, uh, putting elder care into their investment strategy is um, sort of another sort of you know related trend um, that uh, you know is happening because of the demographics of the world. Um, that's an interesting trend. We've Perhaps taken a stance. Oh, As, uh, we, we've taken a stance of actually being generalist investors in this fund. Uh, my first fund was a very specialized mobile app focused fund. I was also a venture partner for a period of time with Christian Robotics, which had very specific areas that they were focused on. And in this firm, uh, in this first fund, in this new firm, we've decided to be uh, thoughtfully decided to be actually quite generalist. And so we specialize around the partners rather than around the firm. We are definitely a tech augmented uh, early stage VC firm, and that's sort of what defines us versus others. We have an amazing network of people around us, and our background as operators, entrepreneurs, investors is pretty unique, both just in Silicon Valley, but also globally, right? You know, uh, 
between us, we've worked in 50 different countries. I think that's not for the fainted, uh, for the fainted, uh, for the faint of heart. Um, we have looked, started looking at energy. I'd say energy is one of those spaces where we have a little bit more difficulty in looking at. But for example, giving a, an analogous example, healthcare was a space that we all sort of tried to stay away from. I always played around with well-being and fitness, and I'm a consumer guy, so I was around that space and difficult to pull a trigger. And then my first investment was driven from a very personal need, which is I, I was diabetic. You know, those that have met me many years ago know that I was slightly bigger than I am today, 130 pounds bigger than I am today. And so uh, I ended up investing in this company called Verta Health, which is led by one of the best entrepreneurs that I've met in my life, co-founder of Trulia. Sami Ikinen. And it was it was an early stage bet. You know, I understood, I think, enough about the consumer aspect to it to make the call. I didn't understand at all enough about the healthcare uh, system and how this would actually work. Uh, and it's now a unicorn. Uh, a second company that, uh, you know, I wanted to invest in, but someone else, I won't go into details, uh, decided to change the deal last minute and ended up, we ended up not getting that deal, is now also a unicorn. Um, and, and so in some ways, I think the point that you're making AF is very interesting. Actually, this one, I would like AF's opinion, which is we, the generalists somehow sometimes get really good investments in deep tech frontier tech in industries that are really, really cumbersome and complicated. And you could call it beginner's luck, right? Uh, whereas sometimes the great sort of dedicated investors, and again, I was one of them with my first fund in mobile apps don't do great right so so what would you attribute that to right is you know is it and, and sort of what are your takeaways right obviously you're very specialized you know your areas really well you're super good at understanding the architectures of what the future might hold but you know what would you attribute that to that is a really good question and something that i try to kind of combat a lot it's we know too much and so because we know too much anything that's going to disrupt the industry we immediately see all the risks associated with that. And because of that, it kind of blinds us from seeing the upside and the opportunity of what if this does go right. And, and I think, in my opinion, that's what I've seen is just sometimes, sometimes that just doesn't work to our favor. It's just like knowing too much of how complex, whether politically, whether policy-wise, whether economic, unit economics, and usually it's what we miss. We miss how consumers are changing because we assume the world works linearly and we assume the customers are gonna to continue to do what they've always done. Um, and we don't take into account an entrepreneur or a management team that's gonna fundamentally change it completely. Uh, and honestly, that's what I am trying to do is understand this is a highly regulated industry, really large ticket contracts with really complex unit economics and economics and all that stuff. But at the same time, like. Who's around the corner that can completely disrupt it? And if I don't understand something, why don't I understand it? And, and, and what, am I, what am I completely missing? Because to me, that's, that's a big fear to me. Like a big fear to me is completely miss that and miss it because we are, I, I know too much instead of just being like, hey, let's take a wild bet and do it and, and things like that. And so like one of, one of those big markets to me is probably the offset market, carbon offset market, I think is massive. Um, it, is a big, it, it is a big risk. It is early in the market. Um, but when you completely dismantle it, everything, I, I think the carbon offset market can blow up into something because a lot of things have to go right in it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's absolutely massive. And, and it's something that, that, that do that. I can talk about carbon capture later. That's, that's an interesting market as well. Um, but, but that's a, that's a whole other different conversation, Bill. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna offer a, 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 a sound bite. Um, a sort of a variation on where F was, which is is that you will not hear you will not hear from any other VCs. I will tell you this, <laughs> that which is that it turns out the best investments VCs make are because they are stupid about the investment. <laughs> that you know to what happens with VCs is. If they think they're smart about a space, then they can come up with an infinite number of reasons why a startup won't work. You know, I mean, who the hell would invest in a company that has to sell the utilities? Nobody, nobody would invest in a company that has to sell to a utility. That's an insane concept, right? Because <laughs> utilities 
are just terrible, horrible, very slow, painful partners, much less, you know, whatever, right? So, uh, you know, and so, you know, VCs are, you know, VCs are not going to invest in a company that has to sell to utility um, because we know we're so smart about the fact that, you know, companies that sell utilities, you know, will never be successful. Some other investor who, who hasn't been around and, you know, somebody comes up with this clever clean tech idea that has to sell the utility, they'll invest in it. And God bless, because the world changes, because the world changes, whatever we think we know as VCs is out of date. <laughs> so, you know, I get back to, you know, the, the, the money we made in clean tech. We didn't make money in clean tech because of clean tech. It wasn't even called clean tech when we invested in these companies. It was, you know, it was an ama it was amazing technology that, you know, nobody had been able to do this technology before. We weren't, you know, we thought there's got to be a market for it somewhere. And then kaboom, you know, so some combination of stupidity and luck is the I, basis I, of most venture success. I, I would take a, a, a slightly more positive tack on what you just said without disagreeing necessarily, um, which is for those around the call, for you to understand how VCs process things, in, in some ways, there's two schools of thoughts. There's the top-down school of thought, the prepared mind school of thought, the Excel school of thought, which is we look at markets, we do industry strategies, we think through research, we do market scanning, and we identify at best the two or three options of how we think these architectures are going to evolve in the future, and we try and bet on winners in each of the pieces that we think are core for it, right? Excel no longer really works like that, but sort of Excel was one of the ones that initially propagated this, right? And then there's the bottom-up way of looking at it, which is sort of the benchmark, maybe Sequoia School of Thought, uh, which is you look at these things as individual decisions. You still look at markets, you still look at a bunch of stuff, but you look at it as that team in that space, in that product, et cetera, and make that call, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Benchmark talks a lot about complex systems and, you know, bacteria, bacteria analogous. I'd never quite understood what they meant by bacteria analysis, <laughs> analogous, but anyway, but, but, but that, that's the f fundamental view. I'm a little bit a hybrid. I believe bottom up is the key. You have to make calls on the team in the market they're in with the products that they have. It's complex systems. It's solely based on that all put together. Um, but I do believe that there's a tremendous slack in early stage, in particular, of fact-based analysis around markets, which is something you absolutely can do in early stage, right? You can do outside and analysis all day long of markets in early stage, right? You don't need a startup for that. Um, so, 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 so I'm a little bit more in the hybrid space. So sort of putting what Bill said, I would say sometimes you need to really look at what biases do you have. The difficulty of the profession of a venture capitalist is on the one hand, we have muscle memory from what we've done before. Mm -hmm. That moment where I met Evan Spiegel for the second time and I should have just said, I'll write the check, right? Mm -hmm. uh, versus that moment where I invested in that startup that failed miserably. This is, by the way, true story. It's one of my antis. So mm -hmm. um, you have all these biases and you're sort of looking for pattern recognition. Now, pattern recognition is great and it's really important for you to be a successful entrepreneur because experience gives you an edge right? Over time, you become better. But at the same time, it starts creating biases. And those biases are the tricky part. To Bill's point, you know, the biases that you have around an industry, because you know that industry really well, and you've, I've seen, I don't know, 300, you know, well-being and fitness companies in the last three years or something. I mean, I, I can't see more, I think I'll puke, right? So it, it's like, you know, so then the question is, how do you unbias yourself? And Af, you were mentioning this earlier on, and I took note, it's a very important point. You take note of the biases you have. There are some that are unconscious you'll never recognize. You take note of the biases you have, and you start treating them. And you're like, okay, I have a bias on this. So maybe what's the option for me to treat this deal in a different way? So I'll give you an example. On well-being and fitness, I always involve another partner in the deal at a specific point in time, because I can't see anymore. I'm just stuck with it, right? If there's something that does require extreme expertise in a specific domain, on the one hand, I will talk to experts in that domain with a grain of salt, knowing that they will have a lot of expertise in that domain to the point that Af was saying, they might not be the right people to give me advice on investment. They will be the right people to give me advice on the market and the competition layer and what issues this company will face for sure. Right. So again, it's it's it, that's why, you know, being a venture capitalist seems like it's really fun and we're writing checks all the time. It's like, yeah, come in and we'll write you a check, whatever. 
And, and I love my profession, as I'm sure Af and Bill would probably say, this is the best profession in the world. Mm -hmm. We are blessed to do this, but it's tough because of this, because it requires a lot of skills, because it requires the ability to have muscle memory without having biases, because it requires looking at stuff that nobody's seen before and still making a call on it and dealing with those risks. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's the exciting piece of this. That's the exciting piece that we're in right now. It's getting more and more exciting, not less and less exciting, more and more exciting. So can I, can I, can I, can I follow up on exactly your point, Nunu, in, in, in terms of advice to entrepreneurs? So what's the advice to entrepreneurs that flows from this? And the advice to entrepreneurs is you've got to figure out what are these unconscious biases that VCs have so you can, you know, if you spend a little bit of time, you'll learn that, you know, you know, oh God, not another web app or not another mobile app or not another, you know, ed tech or not another whatever. So, so you know, VCs develop these biases in terms because we've seen so many entrepreneurs try and fail or even they've tried and succeeded. You've got to make, you've got to be crystal clear for your particular you know, company, business model, value proposition, how it, how it breaks the pattern that may or may not be in the heads of those partners. So you've got to be able to say now, other people have tried this before, but unlike the last wave of X, what we are doing is why, which is how we're going to be successful when no one else has been or whatever, whatever that differentiation is. You've got to preemptively, preemptively address these biases. If you just tell a story about a company you think is going to be successful, the VCs are sitting there saying, yeah, I've heard this before. You know, and I'm, you know, nice guys, interesting team, but yeah, I, you know, whatever. You've got to differentiate yourself from all of the noise in our heads. And the challenge, of course, is you don't know in any given investor what's the noise. So you've got to, as part of your process of interacting with the VC, you've got to assess that out and figure out how can I make it clear to them? How do I get past their pattern recognition? that says, I should, you know, this is not a fundable deal. How do we get past their, their, their knowledge base that says, you know, you can't sell to a utility company? So, or whatever, right? So that, that would be my advice to entrepreneurs on, on this whole point that we're making about the, you know, what goes on inside the head of VCs. So, I had a quick little, really quick, yeah, sure. and it's going to be fast. Fundamentally, what we all do every time we talk to a company is does the probabilistic outcome outweigh the risk? That is literally all we do is we look at every company. Now, the difference is we either do that in 30 seconds or in four month due diligence process. Um, and everything that Nuno and, and Bill are saying is, is exactly that. Some of the risks are biases that we've had because we see the same thing over and over and over and over again. And it's like, how do you mitigate those risks from, an, for, from a VC to a VC? Or how do you communicate that effectively to either increase the probabilistic outcome of, of an exit, whether the size, the market, or whatever that is, or decrease the risk of what they've tried to see? Like fundamentally, that's how I break it down to do my job is like the, the probabilistic outcome has to be able to outweigh the risk for me to be able to, to deploy the capital into this and make sure that we make, we make a return. And so fundamentally, that's literally what I'm doing nonstop. And whether it's a market that's just saturated and you see a lot of competitors, you could still differentiate yourself if you change something, but you have to be able, the other part is you have to be able to effectively communicate that and also be wise enough to look within yourself and your company and your management team to realize how you're going to execute what exactly you're saying. I'm going to stop there. So I'm going to, I, I'm going to pile on a little bit on F, which is to say, you know, so F as a corporate VC, is that fair? you know, thinks a little bit differently than, than financial VCs. So I think F's point is absolutely right. Does the upside outweigh the downside? But the thing that, and somebody mentioned this in the chat, it's not, it's not, it's not a net out, you know, positive or negative. It's does the upside, is the upside potential 10 times better or 20 times? I mean, it's got to significantly outweigh. It can't just, you know, 
you can't just get some McKinsey consultant to say, yes, it's, it, you know, the upside outweighs the downside. It's got to be, you know, it's got to be dramatically better. That's, that's an important amendment, if I may, or, or, uh, ex, ex, you know, extension of what F is saying. F, do you, I mean, is that fair? Well, that's why I say probabilistic, right? And so uh -huh. that's why I say like, I do need that massive yeah. hit, but when yeah. I write it in, if, if, when I financially write it in, like percentage-wise, how that's gonna happen. So that's why I'm, I'm very, I use that word very clearly. It's like, what is yeah. a probabilistic outcome? Because that's oh. what outweighs the risk. Yeah. Okay. I, I always say this, we're, we're not risk takers, right? A lot of people say VCs are risk takers. We're, we're risk mitigators. We try to understand as, pos as well as possible the risks that we're taking. And where they are, there are significant risks. We're like, okay, we're going to take the call and we know there's the significant risk. Like this company's going to get killed by regulation or by a competitor that's very large or by whatever. The worst case for us is that we didn't see the risk is that we revisit a deal five years down the road and the companies failed miserably. We just missed it totally. We just didn't see it at all. Uh, I think that's one of the worst case scenarios we would have, certainly in making decisions in our space. So I'm very much I for a I, lively discussion. I, I, Bill's got, I know Bill's got to run at one. So, all okay. right. And guys, guys, love working with you. And to the audience, um, wish I could spend more time with you and uh, always, always a pleasure and an honor. And thanks to Rob for, for inviting me back, but hopefully I'll see you all again and look forward to catching up. So right. sorry. Take care. Be safe. I, I was trying to save a little bit of time so he could have a, a, a smoother transition out and say a few words, but he got to say what he needed to say. And it was good advice for the folks in the room, uh, the sort of virtual room. So here we are, we're gonna transition at this point uh, in a moment, at least into the Q&A section or session. And to do that, please utilize the Q&A function. It's easier for us to track and uh, make sure that we can try and get your answers, your questions answered. We'll be taking questions that sort of apply to the most number of people and most number of viewers. If they're really narrow, probably won't get to it. Uh, but before we do that, I want to thank F and I want to thank Nunu for, for participating today. I also want to give them an opportunity to speak for 30 seconds, 60 seconds or so. If there's anything they want to share with the audience or if they want to share their contact information with the audience, now is a, a great time to do that. We'll probably do it again at the end, but it's a natural segue at this point. You can do another plug, Nuno, if you yeah. want. Yeah, no, uh, the best way to, uh, normally I used to say LinkedIn, but just write in the note and memo that we we were that, that you basically watched this so that you were in this session. Um, if you're pitching a startup to me, the follow up to that first interaction where we just connect on LinkedIn, if you're trying to pitch that startup to me, I'm going to ask you to go on our uh, contact form on our chameleon.vc. You can see it in my in in my in my um, in my banner there. And if you go to the contact form, we'll ask you for a bunch of stuff, a summary on the company, a pitch deck or a teaser deck, et cetera, et cetera. So, so those are normally the two best ways to contact me. Um, and what else would I like to say in the 10, 15 seconds, besides listening to Tech Deciphered, which you should uh, <laughs> together. <laughs> We're actually very proud, I think, of the, of the work we've done there. And, and a lot of the questions that we address in some of these sessions are about the under carriage the the pieces that are often not talked about and i think bill for example is very good at this the pieces that are sometimes not properly communicated around how silicon valley works how venture works how entrepreneurship works how building a company works and all of that so so i'm very proud of uh, of the work we've done with tech decipher and there's a bunch of really cool episodes and trilogies that we've done on all these these topics wonderful af no, it's been absolutely wonderful. I, I don't have much to plug. And it's the same thing as, as Nuno said, um, please reach out on LinkedIn and definitely add a note to, to, to know that this was the event that we met. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be working on, on an industry that I'm very passionate about, um, that we get to really deploy capital to, to solve some of the hardest problems in the world. Um, to founders, it, it can seem like a slog. It can seem like it, it's difficult, but, but keep at it. Um, there is capital out there, and, and if you reiterate, ask for feedback continuously from investors, doesn't mean you have to take it, uh, but you know, ask for feedback continuously from investors and understand what, what works and what doesn't. And also, sometimes getting a note from investors is a good thing. Sometimes it, wasn't be, it wouldn't be a good fit. Um, and sometimes you need an investor that really follows your vision and has your working style, and you can really 
count on them. And so not, not all capital is the same. Not all, not all term sheets are the same. Not only understand the numbers, but understand the personalities behind them and, and whether they fit with you and your culture and what you're trying to build. That is really sage and true advice. Th thank you. I hope everyone takes that to heart. Um, so here we are on the Q&A se uh, session of today's uh, program. So uh, I'm going to take sort of a pretty broad question, and I'm going to try and tie it to, uh, to what's coming down the pike or what, what we've seen in 2021 and what we see coming down the pike. The question is, how do we get, how does a founder get seed funding? Let me kind of pivot that a little bit and say, you know, some of the mechanics of getting seed funding or other early stage funding got disrupted in COVID. And maybe you talk a little bit about how that's changed and you know what it looks like in the future. Yeah, I think the top of funnel has changed that now it's much more virtual for a longer period of time, right? It's people reaching out to you with warm intros from other people uh, through LinkedIn, sending decks through your website, you know, uh, connecting with you after an event like this, virtual event, et cetera. But it's all, all mostly virtual. I think events are coming back in the Bay Area. I was at an event this week at the Rosewood, which is probably a, a signal that we're coming back <laughs> to the good old days, summer parties. Uh, but uh, so that's good. That's good signs. Because once obviously there's more in-person stuff happening and and all of that, then then there's a, there's an easier path for us to process some of the deals. I think for us it's changed because, as I said, there's a lot more virtual processing, a lot more digital processing. It goes much longer. Uh, we just closed our first deal, um, and you know I, I wasn't able to meet most of the team. Uh, the founder and CEO is here in the Bay Area. The rest of the team is in Europe. I, I I didn't go in person. My partner in Europe didn't go in person. We had to do video calls. We had to talk to other investors. We had to do a bunch of stuff. Funnily enough, this was the first founder I met in person in a long time for a first call, first meeting, uh, which is quite interesting. And so, again, if I was in a position of being an entrepreneur right now, I would try every single hack under the book, right? Warm intro still rule. So if you get a warm intro, you know, the chance of you getting that first call is the highest. Uh, warm intros have different granularity to it or different gradients to, to it, right? If it's a warm intro that I get from someone who's a fellow investor, being an angel investor, a VC, a growth investor, et cetera, that has a very high ranking on my list. If I'm getting an intro from someone who's actually put money in the company very, very high, they're, they have skin in the game, they're not, and again, let's not confuse people who are advisors to the company or getting sweat equity to people who've actually put money in the, in the company. If, if they've put money in the company and the person wants to do an intro, I will take it very highly. Uh, if it's someone who, you know, I don't know much about, I don't know that person well, we just connect on LinkedIn or a party one day, uh, not an investor, whatever, and they're trying to do a warm intro, it's probably the least warm of intros. And in some cases, you have to be cautious because there might be actually negative warm intros where it's someone that is introducing you and, you know, the VC or the investor on the other side might not have a great deal of respect for that person for some uh, reason or another. So do a little bit of your homework. I think the second piece is once you get that first call, really be prepared, right? Don't show up at the call and have no clue of who I am or have no clue of who my co-managing partner is or have no clue of what Chameleon is doing, right? Or what we're focusing on. Do a little bit of groundwork. At least go to our website, right? I can tell you it's one of the most painful things that we have had to do is our own website. We're, we're about to release our second iteration at some point. You know, go to our website, check our LinkedIn profiles. I'm super verbose on my LinkedIn profile. So there's a ton of information there. You could go left, right, center. In, in effect, you're doing a sales process when this thing starts. Over time, it will become more like a partnership discussion, a business development partnership discussion. But when you start, you're selling. And so if you're selling, try and create a little bit that relationship, those hacks of, you know, I, I, end, I, I read what this guy had to say. I listened to this podcast. I watched this video on rejection and adversity as a path to growth. I look at the fact that he's invested in these four unicorns and two decacorns. Uh, looked at the fact that the company that he just invested in IPO today, right? So, so use these anchors as a way to at least create a little bit of familiarity and then be heck of a well prepared on your side. Know your numbers front to back. That's the base, right? Like, you know, your market, if you don't know your market perfectly well, it depends how well you know it. If you don't know your numbers perfectly well, you're out of, you're out of the room. There's no point, right? If I ask you questions around what are your attention engagement rates for this specific product? If I ask you for what's your actual ARR? 
right? You know, is this all ARR or are you putting stuff in ARR that's not ARR, which happens a lot, you'd be shocked. You know, people confuse bookings and sales with revenue all the time and recurring revenue with non-recurring revenue even more often, right? So, 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 you know, be really well prepared, be tight, okay? The final advice I would give, and there's much more advice I could give you through the stages of, of investing in, in seed, but the final advice I would give is, on the one hand, you do need to create a relationship with venture capital so that at some point they invest in you. But on the other hand, we are not your buddies. We don't give free advice because we're cool, right? We are venture capitalists. We invest in companies. We help them in many ways being successful. One of the primary ones is capital, but we help companies in other ways as well to be successful. And we focus very heavily on our portfolio companies. We look at hundreds of companies, in our case, thousands of companies on a yearly basis. We invest, let's say in five or six a year. So a couple of really important things. Don't waste our time unless you really want to have a real discussion and you think there's a real investment there. Picking our brain, not helpful, right? Again, that's not the business we're in. Creating relationships through other mechanisms can be done in a very smart way, right? Through events, through interactions, through warm connections. There's a lot of smart ways of doing back channeling with VCs. Don't just waste the time because you're like, oh, I heard that we need to build relationships two years before we raise our series A. Yeah, but it needs to be a positive relationship. It needs to start from a positive place. And the final thing, and, and this is where I'm very respectful of you guys. Um, I did do, by the way, a video on rejection and adversity as a path to growth idea, the keynote on that. It's something that I use. I do some coaching with a few entrepreneurs and I believe that coaching has gone to performance and you know, it, it's missed sort of the point around happiness in some way. Um, some of us, and I'm sure us around the table, I definitely do, do understand that when you're doing a startup, it is a personal thing. It is your baby, certainly at the early stages. It's literally your baby. And therefore, you know, don't be mad at us if we reject you and the reasons we're giving you are not really cool. Uh, don't, you know, be, you know, pissed off at us if we sort of don't fully reject you and we just hold on and wait a little bit because we want to see you get traction and we don't want to say no. Because we, we understand this. We understand it's personal. So we understand if we're rejecting you, we have to be cautious on how we reject you. So, for example, sometimes you give, you know, I, I have a, a partner, colleague of mine, who loves giving very detailed emails on why are we rejecting you, right? And what he's found out over the years, and now he's sort of backtracking it a little bit, is he always gets emails back, right? People questioning this, questioning that, sending him more data sources, whatever. It's like we sort of passing and we're illustrating some of our thought process. We're probably not sharing with you all the depth of analysis we've done for the past. And we're definitely not sharing with you stuff that might be seen as disrespectful on you or your team that we're passing. So I don't think you'll ever get a rejection on a company that says we don't like you. But it might be that actually whoever is talking to you doesn't like you. And, and for, for many reasons that are valid. They, they don't like the way you're approaching a specific market. They don't like your intellectual honesty or dishonesty. And so all of that. So that's what I would ask from you. I think we try to be as appealing, as appeasing and appealing as possible in doing our rejections, which are many. And it does affect us. You know, it, do, I, I do take it personally as well because it is your personal baby, right? But also give us a little bit of slack. Understand that, you know, if we're, if we're saying no and these are the reasons at a high level, probably there's a lot of depth behind it and we've thought about it and it really doesn't match either our thesis or our thought processes on those specific areas or maybe there is a reason behind it that we can't really tell you because you'd be just mad and pissed off at us um that that led us to make that call right so anyway rant rant over that was very helpful information if i don't know if you have anything to add either to that directly or or you know if you quickly seen any of the the mechanics change kind of in the, the space that you play? No, I, I think, I think he hit it on, on so many in, uh, things. I, there's a few functional things that I, I, that I see over and over and over again. And there is things that I, that I want to say. Um, I call the data room, your company's bedroom. Um, it's a, it's my first view into how your company's organized, how, like how you do your, your files, how your financials are set up and things like that. Like, I feel like I, and I and try to preach this because these are little things that aren't usually thought of. And it's more on the growth stage, like kind of where I am a little bit later stage. Um, 
a well-organized, well-executed data room with a lot of documentation and things like that, it's great for me. I, to me, that gives me a sense of like the, the company's running well and it's well-organized and it's going quickly and things like that. And you, you have your ducks in a row um, for when you're ready to start fundraising. Um, so li- it's like a little bit of energy that takes to do that. That really, I think, at least from my perspective, stands out to me. Um, the other thing is I really do enjoy, uh, and not everyone agrees with it, I enjoy it when founders put me on their newsletters, uh, whether it's a quarterly newsletter or anything like that. Even if they've said no, the no can always turn into a yes. Um, and especially if you just keep me in the loop with that, and instead of having to do it individually, just sending me a newsletter of where the company's going, like, doesn't mean I'm going to respond or anything like that, but I, I enjoy it because I can see where you're going and see where the journey is. And if, and if something, if you're going through a pivot that a lot of companies will, um, maybe the pivot just, you know, solved some of the things that I saw as risk. And now, and now you're right at the alley as to what I'm looking for, but there's no way to communicate that unless you can actually like communicate it effectively to, to the team uh, consistently. Um, also, we're empathetic to, to what you're doing and what you're trying to build and, 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 and you know, hit it right on the key. Sometimes you're not going to get the real reason as to why, why we decline. Um, but also understand that this can also turn into a yes later on. And so if you're aggressive at us saying no and, and doing things like that, that's either going to confirm some of the things that we, we agreed to, or it's going to show you, show us how you deal with adversity at a time. So just heads up on that. So I think the panelists today have been very open and honest about, you know, they try and give feedback. Um, and there's also a lot going on in their mind. And sometimes you could share that. Sometimes you can't share all of it for a whole host of reasons. I mean, one of the things I usually share with clients who are working in this space is, you know, I think it's important to weigh the feedback from the VCs, but then look for those patterns. I mean, I think each of you were talking about patterns before, right? If you're noticing patterns in that feedback, maybe pay a little bit more attention to, to, you know, to what that input and guidance is. Um, and not everything's a fit for everybody. So one thing I want to do and uh, is talk, we, we touched on this a little bit, touched about asset bubbles, maybe some clouds like on the horizon. You know, there's a question in here which asks what kind of contingency plans should we show investors if there's a market downturn? I, I want to get to that question, but maybe if I it could have each of you provide just a little bit of context or your view on, you know, what might be the thing or things that kind of pop that bubble if it does exist. And, and I think that that also maybe gives a little bit of input and guidance as to where people may need to start thinking about planning for contingencies. I, I, I'll put a stick on the ground. I think we're going to have, as I said initially, um, in one of the first interventions, we we're going to have a hard landing rather than a soft landing. Um, look, if we have a soft landing instead of a hard landing, no big deal. We're all good. So, <laughs> so in some ways, preparing for the hard landing might be useful in any case as a scenario exercise. Um, I, I think I don't think it's going to happen this year. I think it's going to happen next year at some point. Again, I'm not an economist, but probably late next year. Um, and it, it will be a massive thing. And you know, we'll, we'll we'll see how it happens. How do you prepare for it? What do you should need to show investors? Um, I, I always say sort of at the right conditions, raise as much money as you can. And, and I do emphasize at the right conditions, because if you're getting super mega diluted or if you're getting way too much cash than you need, right? The classic Masayoshi son, I'll give you 300 million, you ask for 30, might not work because you might not be ready to scale at that pace, right? And then you have to spend that money quickly. But, uh, but again, at the right conditions, right amount, even if it's a little bit more than the right amount, at the good valuation or decent valuation, uh, raise it, raise it. Uh, and then I think the big levers you have are really around the basic things of managing a company properly. Run is burn rate, manage your burn rate properly, be cautious. Don't just you know hire people left and right if you don't have anything to do with those people. You know, still follow a plan that is a plan that is logical. Uh, it doesn't mean that if you have a land grab opportunity, you wouldn't take it, but certainly be cautious around it. Um, you know, if you're raising money to acquire companies, I guess a lot of our audience won't be in that position, but some of you might be, you know, be cautious as well, how much you're paying in cash versus in stock. You know, I would sort of skew towards stock at the stage because stock is obviously grossly overvalued in some way. So, so obviously there, there's a play around that. I think the second element that I would be very cautious around is there's actually a positive element that you can embed in your culture because, you know, we are preparing for 
we're in a bull market, but who knows if there's a crisis out there, which is be frugal, align on what the company actually needs to spend money on, be cautious on, you know, expenditures that you don't need to incur, create the culture we really want to create, not just in the good times, party on, but also in the bad times. And you can leverage it right now. So that's how I would prepare for it. Um, we're doing it ourselves. You know, I, you know, we're, we're doing a, a get together of the still smallish team at Chameleon in Europe because we have an office there in September, October. And I'm like, you know, I have someone that I have advised in the past that's owing me a flight to Europe, whatever. I'm going to spend that time to go on that flight, right? And if I had to go coach, I'd go coach, right? And, and that shows to the rest of the team, this guy, right? He doesn't care that he's the managing partner, right? He cares that we are living by this notion of the resources that are given to us by our limited partners are the resources that we need to really maximize the fruit of, even in management fees. And again, the same with startups, right? If you are thoughtful, if you're frugal, if you're understanding of the culture you want to create, this is a really good time to do it, right? Because you won't go all fireworks. You won't go into the big new office, do a 10-year lease, whatever, you might be like, who knows what's going to happen? So maybe we won't go for the 10-year lease. We won't go for the best office ever. We'll go for something nice uh, that is right for us, that will still serve us well. And we'll see how the next year to year and a half will pan out because there is still a lot of risk in the markets right now. I, I don't want to see a contingency plan. This is under, for me, this is under management. And exactly what, what he said, and very, basically what you said, like, um, we're investing in you to go after a market to succeed. From me, when I'm conducting due diligence, it's assessing the management team, assessing the culture, assessing how, how capital efficient you are to do that. Because here's the deal, every startup's gonna run into issues. And then when I'm talking to a management team, when I'm talking to a startup, when I see their staffing plan and things like that, my assessment is what happens when those issues do come up hard um, and can they handle this eff effectively or not? Basically, because we, and by the way, I don't know, in my thought process, either going to be inflation or a hard crash. Like that's kind of, I'm still trying to figure out. That's why I'm really paying attention to what uh, uh, Jay Powell is doing. And I'm really trying to pay attention to inflation and, and CPI and all that stuff. Um, that's my that's my own personal bias as to where I think the market's going. And those two paths are very different. Um, but I'm basically the bar's hired now to assess management team and how you run your company on what happens during during a downturn during the process, right? Like. Last also last year was a very clear measure of like how you would do. Like a lot of our companies went through the PVP program and, and, and scramble and do that. And honestly, I think there's a survivorship bias on like last year on how effectively you planned for that year, how quickly you cut costs, how good you did in those kind of times. Because it's going to give me an indicator to understand exactly how it, how it's going to happen. Because you can't time it. And what I've learned always is you're not going to be able to time it. It's going to happen. You have to be reactionary. Problem is, like, do you have the culture and the financial discipline to be able to succeed in those times? I think, and I guess maybe one one sort of follow up I have is maybe trying to just elicit some comments on, you know, in the last downturn, you know, what did we see, you know, in terms of companies who had that good stewardship mindset. Uh, you know, either if they started before or during and after and sort of the results of their performance, if you are familiar with that. Yeah, yeah. We have a ton of huge success case studies, right? I mean, Airbnb, uh, if you go further back, Google, uh, if you have the BAT, I think the full BAT, so B BAT is Baidu, um, uh, Alibaba and Tencent were created, I think, between 99 and 2000. So, so there was a bunch of companies that were created just before, either at the top, top of the bubble, just before it crashed <laughs> or during <laughs> already the crisis. And, you know, we, we have companies that because of their stewardship, some of them already have fant fant fantastic business model back then. Some didn't, right? Airbnb, they, the famous story of them selling cereal, right? To make ends meet, right? I mean, freaking hell, they sold cereal. That's like kudos to them, right? It's like... Freaking hell! Uh, so, 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 I think I think the crisis in particular, and we, I think it might have been with you, Jason, last year that I said this when we thought we were going to have a crash, right? We thought we were going to have a crash, and then it wasn't really a crash around March to 
Well, I mean, it, it would, I think it would have been, we can talk about that later, but I, I think yeah. it would have been if a lot of money didn't get injected. That, it didn't get the, injected into, into the markets. Yeah. And, and so we were about to have a crash. So we were sort of seeing it. And I was like, this is going to be a great time. It's going to be a great time for, for resilient entrepreneurs, for them to show that they can withstand the pain of doing this, et cetera, et cetera. I think the difficulty that I have right now is almost the opposite. In a market that is so positive, and you know, I won't go back to my comment on fundraising earlier on, but in a market that is so positive and is so positively skewed, if you're, for example, in an industry that is very positively correlated to COVID, so meaning it's doing really well because of COVID, and you're not doing well, and you have competitors that are doing well, then there's something dramatic about your operating model, how you're doing business, execution, selling, pricing, whatever, that's fundamentally wrong. And, and that, I think, is the litmus test for me right now. Actually, the great thing about a bubble market is there's other types of litmus tests that you can play down the road, right? Um, so, so again, I, I would be thoughtful about what's coming ahead. Uh, you need to sometimes spend money, right? So it's not about you need to be frugal all the time, but you need to show frugality once in a while. You need to show a burn rate that is commensurate with the business you're doing, right? I was looking at the deal actually just two days ago, and I won't say the name of the company. They've raised, you know, let's call it 10 million in the first few rounds, and they're now raising, let's say, 20 million this round. And I looked at their annual recurring revenue, and it's well below 1 million in ARR, well below, right? And I'm like, that doesn't resonate, right? That doesn't, you know, there's something wrong here because you're in software as a service, you're not that capital intensive and, st and it's not deep tech what you're doing. So why is it taking you such a long time to get there, right? Again, so, so these questions are very nuanced, but it's the questions that I hope, you know, at least most, uh, most of the good investors and, and, and VCs out there will ask, right? Perfect, like, you know, like I'm in, I'm in, utility infrastructure, things like that, the beta when there's a crash or when there's a high is a lot less than let's say you're going into consumer product, right? And things like that. And so like, that's how I correlate it. And so yes, the sales cycles and, and getting a contract with a utility company is long, but when the market crashes, you're fine. Like you're gonna be fine. Everything's gonna be fine. I do think the infrastructure bill has some of that as well uh, of certain funds going into that. Clean tech has that as, as there's certain aspects within clean tech where I worry less during a downturn because those are fundamental needs for society to run. Um, but absolutely, I don't even think about what you were saying, like, like the, the high beta for companies right now in COVID and they're not doing well, like in those markets, that is interesting. That, that, that's an interesting kind of marketplace. But that's, to me, it is like when, when you're in that market, especially for my market, it's a little bit more insulated from a downturn, it doesn't mean we don't worry about it. It doesn't mean that it's a big issue and there's things that we're gonna to have to recover. But once again, yeah, like how efficient are you with capital and, and growing and, and building that flywheel for you to grow? Um, so we've got just a, a minute or two left because I'm mindful of all of your time. And you know, you may have other commitments after this in terms of meetings with entrepreneurs or board meetings or meetings with your partners. Uh, is there any, do you have any thoughts or anything that you'd like to share with the audience? And if not, I guess I've got another basic question or two uh, uh, that I can ask that, yeah. that is related to some of these. But I wanted to give the opportunity for you to speak, you know, give the information to the audience. Again, let them know about your, your funds and how to, how to contact you if, if you want to be contacted. Yeah, I think on, on contacts I already shared. I, one comment I would leave, I'm, I'm a very positive person. I'm actually quite nice. The reason why I sometimes play this more Shark Tanky persona, by the way, Shark Tank is BS, except maybe for Mark Cuban, uh, is you know who's legit. But 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 uh, is that there is a little bit of a message passed to you guys that this is serious, complex business. That even if you're a hugely, and some of you are just starting your path, some of you are just starting a company, some of you are just you know going to your first fundraise. This is serious business. I think Ben Orwitz mentions it in, um, you know, in, in a, the hard thing about hard things, right? Which is the whole notion of pain, the pain in entrepreneurs, right? Um, this is for this is a marathon. It's it's and it's it's relentless. It is relentless. You could have an entrepreneur that is eight, nine years, ten years down the road. His company has has managed to raise a shitload of money. Pardon me for my English, and 
you know, it's, and still, they might still totally fail, right? We, we look at companies, I actually know Jason well, like fab.com, right? Huge success. They sold for 30 million, <laughs> 30 million, right? You know, can you imagine that? You're just the best ever, you're a unicorn, you're whatever. And then all of a sudden it just, so at every single point in time, even if you're usually successful, sometimes this comes back to grab you. Being an entrepreneur is something to be very respectful of. I happen to be an entrepreneur in venture capital. I've cre just created my second venture capital firm. I consider myself an entrepreneur. I'm an entrepreneur in a very specific space, a very specific industry. Scalable in assets, non-scalable in people, as I always say. But ultimately, having the ability to withstand that pain is why I'm trying to play this persona. Again, you know, there's a lot of things to be happy about. There's a lot of amazing ideas, sure, uh, that I'm sure you guys have right now that you're working on, and I look forward to the next you know, Facebook, Snapchat, you know, Gusto, whatever coming out of one of these calls, one of the entrepreneurs is on this call. And, and I'm very positive about that. I'm very respectful about the entrepreneurial mindset. But the reason why I play this persona is we should never downplay the pain. And the pain is always there. Even if you're successful, it's always going to be there. Thank you, Nuno. That was, how do I follow that up? That was amazing. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I agree completely. I, I think from words of business, it is a painful, thoughtful process that you're not only going through, you're putting your family members and loved ones through and you're putting your employees through. I'm very respectful of that. I'm the same way. I'm, I'm a very nice VC. I, I, I like to get to know people. I enjoy this, this, this job and I enjoy getting the entrepreneurs. You guys give me energy of, to, uh, of understanding that, but it is a marathon where you have to sprint part of it. And sometimes you have to sit back and, and doing that. Um, I, I love this market. I think this is where the growth of, of our economy comes from is being able to innovate and, and change and disrupt what we're doing and, and really bring the future to us now. That being said, like, don't be discouraged because sometimes timing is timing. And sometimes you, 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 you have the great idea, you have it and timing was wrong. Uh, and we, I know that I'm acutely aware of that. Some, some of the best ideas just didn't work out from a venture back perspective, just purely because of timing. I've seen enough companies like slog along for years and then hit it right when the timing was, was right. Um, but for years they were just like struggling and that's, and at the end, it's exactly what Nuno was saying. It's like, sometimes you just have to struggle and, and slog through that, do that on the other end. I love this industry because like I'm, I'm first gen you know, born here, like immigrants are such a big part of, of, of this space and, and bringing innovation to this country and things like that. And so sorry, I'm, I'm getting into that. But like, I, I'm also very aware that the United States need, need to be very aware of that and, and being able to make the space inclusive and, and allow immigrants and, and everyone else coming to this country to, to really build our future and, and build what we need. And the same thing is, is, is along diversity is understanding that and understanding how, how we can continue to innovate and the moment you think we're done in this space, there's something else that we need to continue to build. So it's, it's an endless uh, cycle of improvement and, and, and bettering innovation within our, within our ecosystem. Well, thank you very much, panel. It was a great dynamic discussion today. Uh, I wanna thank Af Hernandez, who's a principal at Next, X, Next Era Energy Investments and co-founder of VC Familia. I want to thank Nunu Gonzalez Pedro, who's a managing partner and founder at Chameleon. Uh, Bill Reichardt signed off a little earlier, but he's general partner at Pegasus Tech Ventures. I want to thank Idea.IPO for hosting, and I'm Jason Putnam Gordon at Pulsinelli. Thank you, attendees, for attending today. I'll let, uh, appreciate your time. We'll follow up with the video a little bit later, and I'll let you get back to building your great companies. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Gracias.